Welcome everybody to virtual shutting. Tonight we have a slight change of plans. Um, Dr. Fowler and our team of emergency physicians will be doing a quick little presentation um, on critical thinking in patient care. And um, Dr. Fowler, I'm gonna hand it back to you. Sure, we wanna welcome everybody. Uh, we have over 50,000 people that have joined virtual shadowing from over a thousand universities in 28 nations. And we have really, really enjoyed this opportunity to be with you. It's very special to us and to the working group. We wanna thank you for keeping coming back. We're trying to decide if we're gonna take it on, keep going forward in June, but our plan at the moment is to continue doing that. Several of the team are going off to school. And so we're gonna keep building the team uh, unless we hear from you otherwise, and we will keep being here after June and going forward. So please let us know, put it in chat. Uh, Reagan, I can't see chat. So, um, you know, see what the folks are saying. Um, we think virtual shadowing offers a lot. I, I just wrote a recommendation for one of our friends to med school today and talked about what an important role in offering shadowing opportunities all over the world to folks that are seeking a clinical pathway some sort of pathway in healthcare. <clears throat> we were going to be joined tonight by a wonderful physician assistant who is a specialist in oncology. What we're gonna to do tonight is take a little step back about how you get into decision-making. Michelle, who was the author of the slides that we're, we were going to show tonight, was going to talk about how to decide when patients were getting really sick. We're gonna take about one step back and to share amongst Dr. Reno, Dr. Salazar, Dr. Morchetti, um, uh, Dr. Melanie Lippman from Brown University, who's with us here, and myself about critical thinking in patient care. Um, so we want to get to the point of thinking critically so that you won't be standing in a medical setting somewhere like a deer in a headlight and not knowing what you're looking at. Uh, for example, my uh, my students will say, well, doc, I don't see a fracture on there. And they know that Fowler's first law of x-rays is if it's blue, it's broken. And so thinking clinically, you've got to have that set of rules that, yes, the anatomy is quite complicated, but just because you can't see the fracture, that the basic rule, for example, in the case of an ankle, is that if it's blue, it's broken. You can't, if they can't stand on it, there's something wrong with it. Don't send them home with a splint. Keep looking until you find out the answer. And how much did this medical education cost him to understand that? So Melanie, when you think about, I mean, you've had a long pathway. You, you know, you, you studied in England and then you, you were in Yale and then you um, tell them where, where you came from and, and what, education is the combination of? Yeah, I mean, I think it's like, it's really a collection of your entire life experience. Like it's not just the medical piece that you learn, right? It's just, it's a, it's a combination, I think of uh, common sense, um, caring for other people, wanting to do the right thing, using your critical thinking, uh, synthesizing information with the thought of like helping your patient, right? And so Gil, when you think about education, is it's combination of information plus a certain skill set plus a list of experiences? Can you comment on your own background? You've already spoken to us once before about that. Yeah, most definitely. Um, I'll give you an example to illustrate um, exactly this point. I was uh, teaching uh, advanced cardiac life support to paramedic students today who uh, come in very, very intimidated at the beginning of, uh, of my presentation. Uh, it's called a mega code. And um, they're very, very concerned because they've never actually taken care of a patient in cardiac arrest. And now we expect them to bring in this knowledge, this algorithm in their minds, but they've never actually taken care of a patient and on top of that, now you have these very, very critical skills without which the patient is not going to make it. So they always come in very, very scared and very intimidated. So my job as an educator is to tie all these three things together and make this uh, situation, this session as 
uh, integrative of these three aspects as, as we possibly can. So not only are they expected to know the algorithm, Ray, but also we put them through a case-based scenario simulating real life to simulate the experience. And then on top of that, they simulate those skills uh, in, uh, in real time in front of me. And that's the way we, we design education now. It's no longer just a PowerPoint for three, four hours on advanced cardiac life support. That's how we learn, case-based. Absolutely. Um, for all you listening, I don't all 500 of you, um, it is clear that how education and retention occurs continues to evolve as we study the human mind more. For example, interleaving of learning. If you want to learn how to chip a, 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 a seven iron club, just chipping the seven iron club actually is less sufficient then chipping the seven iron club and then swinging the driver and then hitting the putter. It turns out that interleaving training improves education and there are many ways in which this occurs. Suffice it to say to close this slide and Brandon, I'm gonna to come to you next on the slide is that what you are going for in your healthcare setting where it's whether it's med school, pre-PA, uh, pre-MP or whatever is a mix of information. You will then learn a skill set and then you will have to put together experience to be able to remember it all. So Brandon, you've been around for a while. You, you've, you've had so many degrees that I probably, if you talk to yourself, you'd go crazy inside. You know, the nursing practitioner talks to the medic, talks to the doc, talks to the EMS doc. For your years of experience, describe what experience meant. Was, it, it was part of it practice and part of it something that you learned at the bedside and so on? All right. Well, full disclosure, I, I just turned the volume back on about 90 seconds ago because I just got off an EMS call that would never end. And so oh, I, missed, I'm sorry. I missed the first few minutes, uh, but I think I can make some logical answer to that question. So uh, entering into medical school, uh, I had eight years of patient care experience as a physical therapist and as an EMT and then paramedic. Um, that all, all that that did for me was make me comfortable with interacting with patients, but uh, I don't, I wouldn't say that it necessarily gave me um, the, the knowledge that I would need it. You know, I still had to go through all the, the training and curriculum and testing, but um, for me, I feel like the experience comes from the many mistakes and failures that I've had. And uh, I, I learned quite a bit more from those than anything from a textbook or what someone teaches me. And, um, you know, both you and, and Dr. Salazar are both being my faculty when I was a resident. Um, hearing you all tell me about your mistakes, I felt like was equally as uh, contributory to, um, to my experience as well. So uh, and, for me, it was so Brandon, about- what you're, what you're talking about then is that in your education, you have had things handed down to you at the bedside by people that you worked with a kind of oral tradition, whether it's if it's blue, it's broken, always explain a tachycardia. It isn't what it isn't, it's what it might be. You've had things passed down to you that became part of your experience. Would you say that? Yes, absolutely. And it's not about the money. So learning at the foot of the masters is very important. When I, when I think of Zachary Cope in 1921, he was a surgeon in England and he was actually the first one to describe really what became sort of the advanced cardiac life support for the examination of the abdomen. And what I mean was that he put together in a small textbook called the early diagnosis of the acute ab abdomen that what he hoped as a surgeon would keep general doctors out in the burbs all over the world from getting in trouble and harming patients. For example, I get this from exactly 100 years ago. This master said this, he said, uh, the general point can be laid down that the majority of severe abdominal pains, which ensue, which begin in patients who have been fairly previously well, and which last as long as six hours, are caused by conditions of surgical import. Translate that to English. The patient was doing fine. They hadn't had a problem. And now they come in with a horrible pain and the pain has been there for more than six hours and they've not had this before. These people are going to the operating room. 
This is the kind of knowledge from 100 years ago that a master at the bedside would have known. This master had a stethoscope, a pair of hands, no lab work, and no CT scanner from which he was making the decisions about whether these patients were going to the operating rooms. And there are facts about medicine that are simply not found in textbooks and that give life and flavor to the work that we do and make us better providers. And so I remember one of the things that was passed down to me and Elaine and uh, Brandon and Gil, um, think about it, what was a one-liner in, in your career, a, a single one-liner that changed your life as a clinician? Butch Wally, who was uh, chief resident on surgery in 1975 and I was rotating, said to me this. He said, when in doubt, take more history. And what he was saying was, if you are not certain of what's going on, go back and talk to the patient. Folks, I cannot tell you, for those of you preparing for a career in medicine, all 500 of you that are sitting here listening to this, for goodness sake, take a competent history and when in doubt, go back and talk to the patient because within the ears of the patient lies the solution. What about you, Brandon? Any one-liner you were given along the way or was it from Gil and me at the bedside in Parkland? Uh, you know, I... Um... Uh, someone uh, on our faculty, I'll leave him nameless. Y'all will probably know who um, just told me about the mom test um, and, you know, kind of along the lines of uh, doing what you would want done for your mother and assuming you have a mother and you love her, which I, I did uh, before she passed away. So uh, the mom test was kind of my uh, litmus that I use. Um, even the patient that yelling, cussing, and uh, threw a Bible at me on Easter Sunday, um, of all things to do. But yeah, they, I treat them as I would my own mother. Yeah. Elaine, what about you? What's a one-liner somebody gave you along the way? Strictly oral tradition. Yeah, that, that's a great one. I was, I was thinking about it, and um, I don't know if you know who Lee Shockley is. Um, he uh, was a physician at Denver Health, where I did residency, and he retired. Um, but one thing that he, I remember him always saying, and I, anytime I see a patient with this, I still hear it in my head. He essentially said diaphoresis is never normal. Like if you see true diaphoresis in a patient, like you need to explain it and you need to explain it fast. Uh, and Jay has um, just asked us what diaphoresis is. Would you explain it? Yep. That's what I was going to do next. So um, diaphoresis is like when patients come in and they're just pouring sweat um, or they're sweaty, but they're not active, right? So it's normal for us to get sweaty if we're like exercising or running. But if you have someone sitting in a bed in front of you and they're profoundly diaphoretic, um, that is never normal. And that is always, always a big red flag. So, and I think it was Dr. Shockley who told me that, that diaphoresis that's, that's excellent. is never normal. What, what it means, of course, is that the sympathetic nervous system is being activated. And if a person is lying on the bed in a nice, reasonably cool environment, and they're all sweaty, something is terrible wrong with them. And you, you've got to explain it. Uh, uh, Gil, what about you? What one-liner does somebody hand you? The one piece of um, advice that someone gave me one time is that you can be the most phenomenal clinician of all time, diagnostics, therapeutics, interventionalist, but you are absolutely nothing and you will be forgotten in the halls of, uh, of medicine very quickly unless you uh, embrace empathy and um, you make that the, the featured um, item in your, in your arsenal. And I would have never believed you until I got a little gray hair and I started realizing just uh, how much empathy, courtesy, professionalism go far uh, and above uh, just sheer skill and, and intelligence. So that's what I'm going to uh, put on my that's, grave one day. Yeah, Empathy. That's, that's wonderful, Gail. And Dr. Lippman, would you? Uh... Uh, I really echo all of the, the pieces about um, really listening to the patient and having empathy and treating everyone as you'd like your mother to be treated. But following up on the piece about um, objective findings like diaphoresis or Dr. Fowler's rule of uh, always explaining a tachycardia, I remember one mentor I had in residency who really talked to me about the importance of vital signs. And they are, of course, vital for a reason. And it's kind of one lesson that I've always, I mean, apart from the uh, more human pieces that we talked about of listening to patients and uh, 
kind of uh, putting in the human piece of medicine. I think that if you're ever gonna discharge a patient, if you think they're well enough to go home, I really pay attention to those vital signs because if you haven't explained their tachycardia or you haven't explained their abnormal respiratory rate or their low blood pressure or their low oxygen, there's something more that you're missing. So in addition to the, uh, the su more subjective pieces that we talked about, the objective pieces are uh, something you cannot, you, can't, you, you cannot overlook either. So I think it's really a synthesis of the both. That's great. So thank you, Melanie. Thanks all, all of you contributed to that. I, I hope that what you, you know, all 500 of you out there are hearing the fact that for all of these different physician lives that are, ch are sharing our moments with you tonight, we've all had different things that, that still drove us along the path of looking for answers because we've had education through great examples and the mentor as an educator is someone who is committed, who is concerned, who is connected and leads you into the path of critical thinking. For example, uh, following on, on to what Dr. Reno just said, a, a sick patient with a tachycardia, what in the world is causing that problem? Maximum, it turns out that if you all got into a treadmill and I stood behind you uh, with a gun and I'm not gonna let you off and I'm gonna keep turning that treadmill up higher and higher, it turns out that the fastest your heart rate would go up, the speed of your pulse is 220 minus your age. Each of you take your age for a moment. I'm pushing 70 for easy math. So somebody out there who's a genius, uh, tell me what my maximum sinus tachycardia that my heart could be accelerated to. 220 minus 70 is what? All of you smartphone kids have to get out your calculators these days and know that that's 150, right? As opposed to a newborn baby, newborn baby's age is zero. And so what is the maximum sinus tachycardia of a newborn baby? 220 minus zero is what? And you say to yourself, well, gosh, I just want to have rules that make it easy and so forth. Well, these actually are rules that make it easy. You just have to learn about your patient. So sweet Sue then is 20. And we find her with a heart rate of 180 on a monitor in the bed. The question is, what is that? Versus Aunt Minnie, who is 80, and she has, she has a heart rate of 180. Um, let's go back and finish that slide. So in the case of Sweet Sue, 220 minus 20 is uh, 200. That could be a sinus tachycardia, meaning her heart rate is being accelerated by her sympathetic nervous system. She could be sepsic, septic, which is a severe infection. She could have a massive pulmonary embolism. She could be bleeding to death from a ruptured ectopic pregnancy as opposed to Aunt Minnie, who is 80, and she has a heart rate of 180. 220 minus 80 is 140. And therefore, the maximum that her heart rate can normally be accelerated is 140. But we find her at 180. What does that mean? It means that in Aunt Minnie's case, this has to be an arrhythmia. In Sweet Sue's case, it could be an arrhythmia, but it also could be a much more serious cause, like bleeding to death, as I mentioned, or understanding drug dosages. I mean, holy cow about how being able to add all this stuff up where you got a guy, he looks at, like he's about 220 pounds, and I know I can give a certain milligrams per kilo of lidocaine. Didn't somebody tell me that there was a toxic dose of lidocaine? Oh, that's right, that's about four and a half milligrams per kilogram. I hope you all out there are already saying, you mean I have to learn all this stuff one day? And the answer is absolutely right. And so you have to figure out how to think it through. You say, well, okay, 1% uh, uh, strength means it's actually, uh, percent means actually grams per 100 cc's. 1% means there's one gram per 100 cc's. Percent times 10 is milligrams per cc. So 1% is 10 milligrams per cc. And so 10 cc's of fluid would have about 100 milligrams of lidocaine. I hope many of you are saying, do you mean I would actually have to do that kind of calculation in my head? Um, I could ask all the emergency docs around with us tonight. The answer is absolutely. We can check a smartphone app to be, uh, and we would encourage that to be absolutely sure. So that a 70 kilogram patient, which is about 150 pounds at 4.5 mix per kg toxic dose, that he could get about 300 milligrams or about 30 cc's. And you're saying, wait, I just wanted to sew up the dadgum cut on his arm. And you're making me put through all that calculation just to sew up that cut. I never saw um, uh, the doc on Gunsmoke uh, ever have to go through that kind of calculation before he sewed somebody up. Well, think again. 
This is part of the precision that we have to have in medicine because the medical and ethical performance of clinical professionals has never been more important than it is today. We are not some bunch of armpit sniffers, folks. We are a profession, which is the practice of medicine, whether we are physicians, physician assistants, nursing practitioners, doctors of nursing, uh, uh, medical assistants, uh, nurses, and so forth. And so, uh, 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 Gil knows this with me. This was a slide he, he and I put this talk a while back, is that even what we do in the field in EMS medicine with paramedics out in the field, we've turned it into a medical subspecialty and we've, af we've actually given an exam. And I, I took that godforsaken exam in 2013 uh, to be able to actually, so that physicians who go out in the field can actually have to d demonstrate uh, certification. Because ladies and gentlemen who are listening, the innocence of what we do in medicine, it's absolutely over. We are completely accountable for what we do. Being a professional requires you to always be able to explain your actions. And medicine is only and always about the people that we serve. Now, the essence of what makes a clinician think clinically and not just as a technician, the key to the excellence is performing superior medical histories and physical examinations. Um, you see what you look for, and the luck favors the prepared mind. Uh, what Dr. Reno said was so important about the diaphoresis, and what Dr. Lippman said was so important about the abnormal vital signs. If you do this, there's no important message I could give you tonight than this next statement. If you do not look for abnormal vital signs, you will not see them. And since the vital signs are absolutely critical to the health of the patient, you must in what we call the initial assessment as you approach the patient, look for those signs of life that could decide that the patient is in trouble. My old pappy used to say, people look, but they don't see. And so we wanna have luck favored our prepared mind. So as we assess patients, we quickly determine the fundamental parameters such as their respiratory and the circulatory status. For example, the young lady says she can't in, she comes in and she can't catch her breath or you find a guy down on the floor, is he injured? Did he have a, a cardiac arrhythmia or what happened? Or you have this guy standing on a street corner, is this a psychiatric problem? Or did his mother just die of something horrible? Is this a drug induced or a substance abuse disorder? What seems to be the problem? We learn, now I'm changing tracks a little bit. We learn from our experiences, folks, both good and bad. I hope for all of you that are, future medical professionals, that as you go forward, that you never have something that occurs that is a bad clinical experience, especially where you could have made a different decision and something else could happen. I think all the docs on the, on the horn here, here with us tonight would say that we all have cases that wish had gone a different way because medicine is so complicated. And we learn from our experiences while becoming a professional. And this is the practice of a professional who gets better and better at what she or he does, as opposed to an amateur that learns to a certain skill level and never continues to improve their skills. So what makes a student become a great clinician? A solid foundation of knowledge, the willingness to, comply, to apply it, and a commitment to excellence. I like to say, and uh, Brandon, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this, I say with our residents all the time, I don't care if someone's a genius. I just want to have them or for them to have a reasonable aptitude to have a reasonable work ethic, to be able to work hard and to be a nice person. What would you comment about that, um, Brandon? Oh, yeah, I'll take someone that um, maybe not as book smart, but is uh, teachable and willing to learn over an arrogant, egotistical jerk know-it-all any day. And, and Melanie, what, what's your comment about that? Oh, I mean, I agree with that. And I think that finally, um, maybe the, even like, of course, as competitive as uh, the application process is to getting into medical school or to getting into all these other programs, I think they are starting to value the human piece a little more. And it's more than just the pure GPA and board scores, right? Like they actually do value people that are critical thinkers or have experience that 
maybe make them better clinicians beyond what can be uh, examined on a, on a test, right? That's absolutely right. And so you would really make yourself take the time to, link to, to listen. Now, folks, this is an important slide. And um, uh, Elaine, I would love to have a comment about this uh, after we get through this slide. To think critically about a patient is the process of determining the authenticity, the accuracy, and the value of something. It's characterized by the ability to seek reasons and alternatives, to perceive the total situation, and folks, to change your view based upon the evidence. Elaine, I like to say that one of the worst things we do is the creating of a differential diagnosis where we weigh all the facts and are willing to change. What would you say about that? Did you say it's one of the worst things we do? I think it's what I think the our abilities, or at least our ability to teach the creation of a differential diagnosis is, is one of the less optimal things that we do, that we, we don't demand that differential diagnosis from our students. What would you say about that? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that this slide is, is really, really valuable. Um, and I have a really great example of, um, you know, so we're emergency medicine and patients come in critically ill and sometimes we don't know why. Um, and so, you know, I have this happen to me all the time, but certainly I had this happen to me recently. And um, one thing that I did is I, we were in a, you know, a resuscitation room, the patient was critically ill. There was kind of a lot of moving pieces in the air. Um, and I paused the room and I asked everyone in the room, like, you know, I had two residents with me. I had respiratory therapy. I had nursing, you know, several nurses with me. We had medical students. Um, we had emergency department texts and we said, let, let's like talk about this patient um, everything we know about this patient from history, everything we're finding in the um, physical exam. And then let's do a problem-based like differential diagnosis and assessment of this patient with the entire room for exactly this reason. Like something was wrong. I didn't know what it was. Um, I don't think anyone knew what it was. Um, and we wanted the whole team to like just pause for a minute and think about what are all the possibilities that are going on so that we don't miss anything. And we wanted the whole team involved in that discussion and um, in that management and plan because it was a really, really complicated patient. And, um, you know, everyone sort of had pieces of what to add and what we need to think about next. And so we wanted everyone on board thinking about why is this happening and what is, you know, our differential diagnosis for the things that are happening right now. So I, I think that's- Elaine, you so mean that in the that. middle of a critical, in the middle of a critical patient, you stopped and you polled the room of physicians and non-physicians alike to try to gain additional information, suggestions, and uh, people drawing on their experiences to help you weigh the facts, even though you were in charge. Yeah, I mean, always. And you know what, every time I run a code, a code is a cardiac arrest or, you know, someone's heart has stopped and we're doing CPR and pushing medicines to try and restop their heart. Um, always, even before I do what we call a call a code, which is before we call time of death, like um, when we're running the code, I always ask for input and suggestions in terms of, is anyone thinking of something that we're missing or, you know, seeing a key piece of information that me as the person in charge of the room is unaware of. Um, but then the other thing I always do is like, when I know, when I think we've hit the point where this is not going to be resuscitatable and I'm going to call time of death, um, usually in codes, we push a medicine called epinephrine. And then we usually do several rounds of CPR to let it, you know, circulate and, um, and we're pausing for pulse checks. And so usually before I call the code about when we push the last, what I in my mind think will probably be the last round of epi. And then we have about two minutes that we're gonna do CPR before we're gonna pause for a pulse check and a rhythm check. And at that point, I'm gonna call time of death. I, I always stop and I say to the room, I say, I'm gonna summarize what we know and where we've been. And then I say, at this point, we're gonna do one more round of epi. We're gonna do two rounds of, or two minutes of CPR. We're gonna pause for a pulse check and a rhythm check and an ultrasound of the heart. And if you know, we don't find signs of life at that point, I'm going to call time of death. And I want everyone in the room, if you have suggestions or thoughts or opinions before we take that step, like, 
like speak up now um, and, sh and share it because we don't want to, you know, we don't want anyone's sort of um, anyone's like thoughts or if anyone has an idea um, to go unanswered before we take take a step of calling time of death. So I think it's really, really valuable to always be thinking about what could be happening um, and what is your differential, but bringing everyone into that conversation, especially with critical illness. Elaine, that's wonderful. And I hope all of you that are listening to this, what you heard was a highly skilled physician who has the humility to know that it can be impossible to think of everything and that the value of teamwork is critical. Now, ladies and gentlemen, who are gonna be applying to med school, to PA school, nursing practitioner, and so on school, one of the ways that you're going to be critiqued on your application is that you can demonstrate as a young person, your willingness to be part of a team, just as Dr. Reno was describing. So please give that some thought. That is a very, very important factor. Elaine, that was terrific. So critical thinking then involves clinical decision-making using medical inquiry. We ask questions and then we have to think. <clears throat> so how do we think things out? There's inductive reasoning and deductive reasoning. And when we induce, we use specific observations to form general conclusions. Uh, when we deduce, we then develop specific specific conclusions from general propositions. Inductive reasoning, we start with an observation, with a pattern, a tentative hy not, uh, 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 hypothesis, and then we move on to a theory. You might say that's the bottom-up approach. Deductive reason, we start with a theory from which we develop hi a hypothesis, from which we then make an observation, and then we do a confirmation. This is the top-down uh, approach, and um, we do both during diagnosis. Through observation, we induce that a patient has a general condition like respiratory distress. We then deduce what caused that problem, the respiratory distress, by getting further information, a swollen tender calf, stabbing chest pain with hemoptysis, and forgot to take the Coumadin. This would be the sign of a, of a large pulmonary embolism due to a blood clot that was in the calf. So we first and induced that a general condition was present. We then deducted, we deduced what that problem was by getting further information. Um, there's a phrase we use in Occam's razor where what we try to do is squeeze everything into one, into one path. And so do we say, do all these signs and symptoms all fit into one path because all of their mouths are open uh, are they all of the same genus and species? And the answer is, of course not. Go ahead. Um, what now? Uh, with, with this slide, please go ahead. I mean, the only corol the corollary to that, I like what Ray, uh, where Ray is going with this, but I think the corollary, and I can think of sometimes when patient care has maybe missed something, is the danger of anchoring bias, right? Like, say you have a patient that comes in, they're in respiratory distress, like you said, they're short of breath. The emergency department has done some tests. They've decided they think this is pneumonia. They're going down the treatment pathway for pneumonia. You now take over for this patient. It doesn't really add up to you. You might, you might have been fed misinformation, right? Like you cannot um, take it as the gospel what someone else has given you, right? Like if it's not adding up, you need to go back and reassess. Maybe they missed something. Maybe you need to look a little further. So that anchoring bias is like very dangerous, I think, right? Like somebody's told you it's definitely pneumonia. It doesn't really make sense. Like maybe you're missing something, maybe they're missing something. So don't get too caught up on premature closure if the facts are not adding up. Yeah, what you just heard is a very important statement about the issue of anchoring. The, the brain, the human brain uses 25% of the rest energy of the body. It, it uses a lot of energy. And when you are tired and you're what you have 15 different patients with complex medical diagnoses, you're weighing all these facts and figured. Moreover, you're tired, you're hungry, you've got to pee, you've got a lot on your mind. The, the mortgage is due, there's a lot on your mind. And when you can kind of explain things using that razor right here, that what Occam's razor is, is can you say that all the facts fit together into, uh, into, a, a, into one simple explanation? That is sort of mentally 
easier for the brain to do that. But what Melanie was saying is that we have an obligation because we're taking care of human life, that we must continue to examine the facts, especially when the patient is now under our care. Uh, Gil Salazar, what is the most dangerous time for clinical care in the emergency department? The uh, transition of care for us is notorious for a time, to, for it being a time in which mistakes get made. You know, we work in, in shifts and we work hard and uh, sometimes we can't tidy up uh, and we have to hand uh, patient care to other clinicians in our specialty or others. It is so you dream. mean actually in, in our busiest ER in the United States, there's actually risky times generated three shifts a day where we're handing, we're handing patients off that we've got a presumptive diagnosis on and you're going to follow up on them? Think about the fact that on our busiest days in our emergency department, we can see upwards of a thousand patients per day. Each of those patients needs a disposition. About 25% of those patients are going to be admitted to the hospital. An even bigger percentage are going to be handed off from one clinician to another. And uh, that is the one time where information can, um, can be lost, can be forgotten. You move on to do better. Uh, more complex things and details uh, can can go by the wayside. So transition of care are a humongous, uh, humongous problem for us, and we take active steps to mitigate them, but it's not easy. I, as the oldest faculty member in our ER, which I am, um, one of the things I have started doing in the last couple of years is that I log into the medical record from home and I go over the 15 or 20 patients that are in the pod, it's called clinical pods, where I'm going to be going. And I just sort of follow the patients so that I just get the information in my head and I make up my own opinion about what I think is going on. When I then receive the patients from the doc where I'm coming on and they're going off, I certainly listen to what they say. But ultimately, it follows to me if I am responsible for the final diagnosis that I have to not anchor where I put an anchor down and says it has to be this, but rather that I weigh all the facts to be able to make the right decision. Thank you, Gail. That was right on. So uh, I got this from our dear friend, Jeff Beeson, uh, who was talking about pre-loss strategies. What are things that we can do before a loss occurs? Well, what causes errors? Most result from incomplete or poorly performed physician, patient assessments by the physicians and their staff. And so we have to try to eliminate those. The goal is to unmask our errors in the patient assessment process through the development of what we call debiasing techniques. So how do we do that? We use checklists, uh, just like pilots do on airplanes. Be familiar first, but then use the darn checklist. You're going to put an endotracheal tube into a trachea. It's fine that you know how to do it, but the checklist is there for a reason. The partner checks the list, read it aloud, never point a dose of medicine at someone that is more than they need. Um, uh, glucagon, for an example, um, uh, is, is a great example of a drug that we use regularly in medicine, uh, which is to try to bring the patient's blood sugar up, but it can have other effects. And what dose of the drug are we gonna give? Is it gonna be based upon a weight-based dose? In EMS, weight-based doses are notoriously wrong, notoriously wrong. And so uh, it's a very critical point. Heuristics means explaining things. It's rules that explain how people make decisions, how they come to judgments and how they solve problems. And the thing is, the way you interpret your words can predispose a specific response to a certain situation. My nurses and my residents know that I, have, that I inherited my father's nasty temper. My daddy was an army general. He was, he was a great man and a bad dude. And I inherited his temper. And I, um, and I have to say that there are certain very annoying, loud, critical, mean, angry, cursing, raving, abusive patients that to be candid with you, I get angry sometimes. And that can predispose a specific response. And it is important that we as clinicians, whatever responses are being brought in, we have to be very careful about those responses. Go ahead. One piece to expand on that too is uh, the way that you uh, try to extract information from the patient. Um, I think making it very open-ended is important. So like one, 
most, I mean, say for example, take the emergency department, patients will have already been triaged by the triage nurse and they've been determined to have a particular chief complaint like chest pain with a little bit of a descriptor. You can't just take that as a hundred percent true, right? Like I always like to ask the patient and I know they sometimes get irritated because they think we don't talk to each other, but I really like to hear firsthand out of the patient's mouth because sometimes it's like that game of telephone. Like the story has been told to somebody and told to somebody else and told to somebody else. And it changes over time. And it, what you think is true is actually not the real truth. So I like to hear it in their own words, describe what made you come in here, or can you describe it a little bit more to me yourself, just so you're not being fed information by somebody else. And then also like not asking leading questions like, oh, you didn't have a fever, right? Or you didn't have this. Um, if you ask a leading question, you're gonna miss out on a lot of information. So keeping it very open-ended and hearing it directly from the patient and not from secondhand from somebody else, I think is important. All of you listening to this call tonight are future clinicians. It is easy just to pick the facts that we want, to look for the evidence that confirms the assessment that we've already made. Um, I have what I call Fowler's Law of Lab Work, which is never try to explain away the result of a test that is the reason we did the test. For example, a guy comes in with a bellyache. You say, well, I'll get a complete blood count and see if he's got an elevated white blood cell count. And he comes out with a white blood cell count slightly elevated at 11,500. And I try to explain that away. Oh, this is not a surgical problem. He was just excited when I was drawing his lab work and that's causing a false elevation. Well, that's explaining away the result. No, the test was specifically looking for an elevated white blood cell count. So it's very important that we keep our minds open so that we often fail to consider the persuasive evidence that changes that assessment because it's so easy to attach a label, that label tends to stick, for example, at shift change in the emergency department, even if the label is wrong. So what I would like to do now, Reagan, is I would like to move into a Q&A period. Uh, please, Gil, and all the rest, please stand by. Uh, and uh, let's, uh, well, let's talk. Who's got questions? I'll start with a question, Dr. Fowler, if I might. Um, at what point in your career would you say that you felt the most comfortable you were being a leader, uh, taking care of patients when you're ultimately responsible for a patient, you have worked with learners, residents, medical students. When did you feel like you were the top, top of your game? When did that start happening for you? Everybody's different. Um, I started as a very young man here in Georgia where I'm sitting at the moment. I was in med school by 20. I was an MD by 23. I took a year off. I did a year of surgery and I found myself at 26, going on 27, working full-time in an emergency apartment in Gill, I realized I didn't know anything. And I was calling the, in those days, you really didn't have, didn't have textbooks sitting around. We didn't have the internet. So the only person I could talk to was the consultant on the telephone. So I call those poor guys probably 70% of the time, Gil, in the first couple of years. And I guess my first answer to that question, which is a really important question is, I realized about three years into it that I hadn't called any of the consultants in a long time. You understand what I'm saying? Is the fact that I'd, I'd begun to begin to see it and to gain confidence in what I was doing. And then finally I came back home and about 35 years ago, which would have been in the late 1980s, I'd be wandering around our local suburban hospital at four in the morning, uh, working overnight in the ER. And I realized I was the only doctor in the hospital. And if something happened, I, handed, I had to handle it. So it was a gradual transition. You sure don't get there like flipping a switch on and off. Um, uh, how about you? I mean, you're one of the great doctors I've ever known. Uh, when did you start feeling so confident? Because I've known you a long time during your training. You know, my, my answer is probably going to surprise a lot of you. It, you know, I felt very confident with the medicine of it. It wasn't until I really learned the meaning of emotional maturity. Um that's when I really started feeling at the top of my game where I could actually be a leader and take care of patients. I, I've, I admit it. I've was always kind of known uh, as a bit of a hothead sometimes not listening uh, to my team sometimes and to much to my detriment and definitely to my patient's detriment. So it wasn't until I learned emotional maturity 
as a true skill of a leader that I felt at the top of my game. It took me a while. There, there was another time, and I think Elaine will smile, and maybe Brandon might smile about this, was when I, uh, I realized that nurses and other staff in the hospital were coming up to ask me questions about, what is this on my arm here? <laughs> when, when other medical professionals began to gain some confidence, and I guess what they thought was my skill set, I think that was a time, one of the times I began to feel a little more confident. Okay, so uh, let's keep going with the Q&A. Okay, would you say that the critical thinking that you use daily as a physician is similar to the critical thinking and reasoning that um, is used for the MCAT? Wow, that's a great score. A great question. Uh, so the question is, let's restate the question. The critical thinking that you do to weigh issues at the bedside of information, of physical exam, of so forth, is that the same kind of intelligence that is used for the MCAT? There are three types of intelligence. There are analytical, critical, and practical. It, is, it can be said that the intelligence required for the MCAT and those similar standardized exams, and people tend to do similar scores on standardized exams, falls to their critical intelligence, which, which loosely is linked overall with IQ. The IQ is also a standardized test also, so no kidding. Um, what you do in studying for your coursework to get that very important GPA is much more kind of uh, critical. Um, I think that the third kind of intelligence, uh, it's analytical if there's obviously an emergency present. Um, Otherwise, I think it's more problem solving and practical. I would be interested to hear of anybody else uh, that would feel otherwise about that. But uh, I think there's a little overlap, Reagan, but I think it's, uh, I think it's uh, somewhat different. Good question. I agree, it's a little different. I mean, it's, I'm sure that MCAT probably tries to simulate that, but there's only so much you can ask in a written question, right? Like. Um, I think patient care is a little, it's a little beyond that, something that can't fully be tested on a, on a written test, but it's kind of like the same critical thinking you would apply to your general life. That's great. Let's take another two or three and then we'll move on. Is there any follow-up for ER doctors with patients who they discharge and how can ER doctors get better at identifying issues that they don't get follow-up when they make a mistake? That's a great question. Um, Brandon, you want to take a stab at that? Did you hear the question? I did, yeah. And um, actually, um, Elaine Gill and I were all replying uh, to that, that question in the chat. But when I was um, a first and second year resident, I got in the practice of writing down medical record numbers for all the patients that I would admit. And then about two to three days later, I would look up what happened to them upstairs and more often than not, I'd be pretty surprised what their final diagnosis and their course of care ended up being. And it taught me how to um, appreciate, uh, we call it upstairs care, um, and how it changed the way that I approached the patients down in the ED. Um, and then um, Dr. Salazar also um, ran a thing within our residency where Sometimes there were bad outcomes or outcomes that we didn't necessarily expect. And we had the opportunity to go back and objectively review those cases mm -hmm. as a residency group. And it was humbling. You know, you do some peer review um, of your um, uh, colleagues and you see some of your uh, own cases. And like I said, at the very beginning of this, I learned so much more from the mistakes that I made than by uh, doing things correctly but you have to look for them. That's the key. That's super. All right. Um, thank you. Uh, Y'all keep uh, hitting the questions in chat. We'll go about 20 or 30 more minutes, folks, and we'll go longer if you want. Um, so as medical professionals of any type, we end up taking our time to confront someone we serve. They call for our service or they've come for our service. We do our exam and we render our opinion and we decide what therapy needs to be done. The risk is the tendency, ladies and gentlemen, and please, for heaven's sake, think of this as we go forward. The tendency is to believe more, that we know more 
than we actually do. There was an article that I was reading today that had to do with rare diagnoses. And it had to do with the fact that most practicing family physicians don't take care of many patients with rare diagnoses because they are rare. They don't know about them. And the risk is the fact that you can say, oh, it's just a virus. Well, crap, folks, there's a virus in America that's killed 557,000 Americans in, 10, in 11 months. And so just a virus doesn't cut it anymore. And so the important thing is, is, is to not be overconfident. Uh, and you first have to be a risk manager first and foremost. So Brandon uh, uh, and uh, Gil, but especially Brandon, since you're right in the middle of an EMS QA effort, do you ever find that there are medics in the field that have a tendency to think that they more th that they know more than they actually do? Yeah, um, you know the most dangerous person out there. Uh, don't care what profession you're in, is the one who doesn't know what they don't know, and then acts like they know it all. Um, to me, those are the ones that. Uh, we spend most of our energy trying to work to um, educate, remediate, and so forth. Um, you know, I, I've been in EMS now over 45 years, and I was in EMS for half of my career before we got, got 12 lead electrocardiograms out in the field so we could actually do EKGs on patients. We could do rhythm strips before, but we couldn't do electrocardiograms. And so... I just assumed that the tool would become for the medic the same thing that I treat the tool in the ER, that we would be looking very carefully for minute stuff on the cardiogram that could indicate, that it didn't prove it, but it could indicate that the patient was at risk instead of something that you might see on an overconfidence by, well, Ms. Jones, you know, your chest pain is gone and you don't have a cardiac history and your EKG is normal. See, it says normal right here. And so uh, maybe it's not an emergency. And of course, if you're emergency, if it's not an emergency, your insurance probably won't pay for it. And our ambulance rides cost a thousand dollars now. And we were just down at the hospital. They are lined up out the door in the ER. You will be there for hours and you could see your doctor in the morning. What is it you would like for us to do? This is absolutely manipulative overconfidence bias. And you say, how in the world can that happen? Can it happen? that someone would do the following, ladies and gentlemen. Whatever your concept of sin is, it is a sin for a medical professional, and that means you in the future, to make a recommendation to a patient that you are unqualified to make. Whether you admit it or not, you're unqualified. Causing the patient to make a decision that is harmful or may be harmful to their health. Don't let that happen you usually get away with it, but occasionally you don't. And so Reagan, the point was you were saying about then what Brandon would do was write down medical record numbers. Uh, I, the Epic medical record that we have now routinely lets us follow patients to some degree, though it's not optimal about how easy it is. You have to, for example, as Brandon talked about, actually write down the medical record number as opposed to pull a search on Ray Fowler for all the charts I saw in the last seven days because uh, this is the particular one I'm looking for. Another way we find out if the, uh, is called three-day return to the emergency department. Was that you, Reagan? I think that answered the question. The three-day return to the emergency department, we follow those very closely. And so if a patient comes back to the ER, and let's say it's a problem related to what you sent them home for, and if it comes out that you know a group of your peers looked at the care that you gave and say, you know, you did this for this problem, but the patient got worse and maybe instead you should have done this. And so hospitals now have quality assurance teams. I tell the, and this is important to you guys and gals out there. We have a continuous quality improvement CQI committee uh, in our ER. And I will tell you, and Dr. Gardner, who is the chair of that committee has spoken to us before. And um, uh, I, have, I, I am on the committee but, and I have said many times, it's, it's great to be on the committee. You don't want to be on the agenda of that committee because somebody, a patient got hurt and they're talking about your care. Oh, I have a corollary. Uh, and what's your corollary, Melanie? Uh, my corollary is, well, one, the medical record actually, um, ours does have the ability to create patient lists. And so 
echoing what every, a couple of people have said, I have created lists of patients that I'd like to follow up on. And um, I think that is infinitely valuable to follow up several days later, a patient that you admitted to find out how they turned out and you can learn so much from that. So I, I 100% echo that. And then the other thing that I really have learned so much from is um, our, I think what a lot of, a lot of uh, what is common in the practice of medicine is these morbidity and mortality conferences. And they're really educational and I think really beneficial to everyone if they're done in a non-judgmental way, but they will present uh, patient cases that were maybe, maybe not anybody's fault, but maybe something suboptimal happened to the patient. It could have been something missed. It could have been a systems error. It could have just been a number of reasons why something happened suboptimally, but if it can be discussed with a group of your peers in a non-judgmental way, like, hey, how could we have done this differently? Or what would you have done? Or would you have done this? Or would you have not done this? Or what could we have done? Or what can we do in the future to not let this happen again? I think that is incredibly useful. Thank you, Melanie. That was great. Um, one normal part of human nature, especially when you're tired, you're working, you've been, you're 11 hours into a 12 hour shift, is that if you find what you think could be an answer, is that you stop looking. The term we use is called a differential diagnosis. If someone comes in with an abdominal pain, it could be a dozen, it could be two dozen different issues. And just because the first lab test points to a certain diagnosis, does not mean that that's where you should stop looking. There's a tendency to call off a search once you have found something that you think reasonably explains the facts. And as I mentioned, abdominal pain, sometimes it's easy, but often abdominal pain isn't, and it takes mental commitment. Um, for example, here was a case that I knew about. Uh, this was a young woman uh, who was uh, told um, uh, that she just had the flu and to go home. And so she did go home and then the EMS was called, this happened about 20 years ago, EMS was called to come to her at which she was in acute difficulty breathing, severe respiratory distress to the point where she, uh, this was a young teenage girl to where the point in the field, they had to put a pressure support mask on this young lady and in fact improved. Well, the ER, where they took her actually said, well, let's see what our arterial blood gases look like on room air, which means they took her off oxygen. The patient had a cardiac arrest and died. The point was a reasonable physician would have looked at this case and said, wait a minute, she is able to maintain her oxygen only with positive pressure respiratory support. We don't need to get a, a room air blood gas. We've already got the question answered for us. And so to wrap up, and we'll, uh, in, a, in a moment or two more, we'll go to a few more questions and then we'll call it an early day this evening, Reagan. So our potential mistakes are anchoring, which is we take an early thought about what we think the diagnosis is and we put an anchor into it and we show an unwillingness to move or a diagnosis momentum where the diagnosis seems to move itself along and try to drive us in the direction that it seems to be wanting to take, but it could be away from the direction. For example, a young woman who comes in with right lower quadrant pain, she's a childbearing years. She's also having some vaginal discharge. She's having a little bit of low grade fever and she's quite tender. And when you lift her cervix, uh, she's also, uh, uh, and she is uh, sexually active, but not married. You lift her cervix and it's quite painful in the right lower quadrant and you make the diagnosis of pelvic inflammatory disease without getting a negative pregnancy test. In fact, you say that this was an infection that you can treat with some antibiotics and send her home. But in fact, she has a pregnancy in her tube that can rupture and kill her. And so we have to be methodical. We can't just pick the cherries off the top of the bowl and assume where the diagnoses are because we then become overconfident. And if we become overconfident, that we, we tend to hurt people because it's hard to abandon that pretest probability, especially once your mind is always made up. This is a story of a journalist uh, in Washington, New York Times correspondent, 
named David Rosenbaum. He was mugged while jogging one evening in Washington, D.C. EMS assumed him to be just drunk. He was made a priority three instead of a priority one. Uh, this was an unfounded prejudice that followed him all the way from EMS, where the medic said, oh, he's just drunk, they said, into the ED and cost him his life. His Glasgow coma score, which should be between three and 15 and wide awake with your eyes open like his picture is, is a Glasgow coma score of 15. His was a six, which means he was comatose, but he was made basic life support by the medics. He lay in the ER for an hour before his vomiting alerted the nurse and uh, his family sued the city, but they then gave the money back to the city saying this, that if, and we'll conclude with this and we'll, we'll move to our final set of Q&A, uh, Reagan, after this slide. If through the investigation of David Rosenbaum's death that the public can be assured that the District of Columbia Fire and EMS will give the proper care and treatment to all John Doe's lying on the district streets, regardless of where they are found, then David Rosenbaum's tragic and cruel final days on earth may have rendered payable service to the people who live in or visit the nation's capital. So we'll conclude this by saying that this, the message to all of us is that we wanna be people with reasonable aptitude, with a strong work ethic, with a commitment to service to others. There is a path to continual study that you will have to adopt all of your career. You must treat people like Gil said, I believe it was, or it was Brandon that says, treat them like you would want that you would want your mother treated. The patients are not there for us. We are there for them. Never anchor on a diagnosis unless you become confident through sufficient information. And Fowler's final law. It isn't what it isn't. That is what you've already ruled out. It's what it might be that'll hurt your patient and get you in trouble. Let's take another set of questions now. Okay, this one is aimed for Dr. Morshetti. Do you ever feel like quitting the profession because of stress or burnout? Uh, not in the last few hours, no. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> No, it, it's a good question. Um, you know, you can become so impassioned with what you do and uh, feel so strongly about, you know, you want to make a difference and you think about all the reasons that you get into this profession and um, beating your head against a solid brick wall and not making any movement. And that can wear on you after a while. And you have to have balance. And I'm the worst person to be talking about this, um, but, you know, balance on seeing um, your work with uh, your hobbies, the things you like to do for fun, you know, me with my kids and traveling and the 30 chickens that I own now and, and all these things, like, you have to have balance. And so if I ever feel like my, uh, my career is taking over, um, luckily I have a wife to keep me in check and remind me that I'm, I'm getting out of balance. So I've never come to the point of thinking it's, it's time to quit. I'm, I'm far too early into this career to be thinking of that and hopefully never. Um, but I have had many times where I've uh, had to step back and kind of reprioritize. And can the bureaucratic side of medicine be frustrating, especially in the ER when you're pressured to help as many people as quickly as possible? Elaine, take that one. The bureaucratic side of medicine, is it ever frustrating? Yeah, that is a really good question. I mean, um, uh, I think it, it sort of starts to fall in like what you believe personally. Um, so one of the reasons that I am an ER doc is that I personally feel that everyone, that healthcare um, is a right, not a privilege, and that everyone should have a right to access, um, you know, safe, competent, efficient medical care. And so, you know, in the United States, by law, um, I'm required to provide that, and the law is called EMTALA. And so... Um, the bureaucratic side of healthcare is less prevalent in my specialty as an ER doc um, because of that law. So I am never told that I can't take care of a patient. Like I, I'm never told that, you know, I can't like 
provide care because this patient is uninsured or underinsured. And I did my residency training at a county hospital. Um, and I'm now in academic medicine where I feel like um, the providing of care to everyone is like widely recognized um, and is very valued amongst like my colleagues and where I work. Um, but I specifically picked a special specialty where I would never, you know, turn a patient away because they were uninsured or underinsured or didn't have any financial resources. And so I think that if I was in a specialty where I was forced to make those choices, I would struggle and I, I don't know how long I would last. And I think for me, that would be a major, major contribute contributor to burnout. But I recognize that I, I thought the ability to access care was a critically important for everyone and everyone deserved medical care. And so I made choices in response to that. My response to that, that was great, Elaine, and so well said. My response to that is a, a, a tale that I'm working on right now. And I'm, I'm gonna call it standing in between. And the story is of a young adult woman who came in with Hodgkin's disease covered up with a disease. Hodgkin's disease is usually curable. Uh, it wasn't when I was a kid, but it, it's curable now. Well, this lady had done everything the doctor asked her to do. And in spite of that, she was riddled all over with cancer. She had collapsed many of her vertebrae. She was in horrible pain at home, uh, taking strong pain medication at home. And the, and the reason I saw her in the ER was that even her strong pain medication uh, was not working anymore. And so all I did for her uh, was to walk in the room, started an IV. I gave her some strong intravenous pain medication and I made her more comfortable. And I read her chart and it was just such a depressing story for her because she'd been a very, very careful, a dedicated patient. And in spite of that, she was dying of her disease at a young age. And so I just sat with her on the bed and I held her hand. I said, and you know, I don't really have anything I can offer you much, but I, would you like to have a prayer together? And she said, um, I would like that very much. And so we did, we had a little short prayer, uh, just a spiritual moment together. And in the room next door to her was this methed out jerk, a young adult, long haired, smelly male who came in, dragged in by the cops, screaming, raving, bloody murder, uh, high on methamphetamine and alcohol, uh, who had been seen multiple times, also had been using IV drugs and he was now running a fever. Uh, the, the, the needles he was putting into his arms were rotting out his heart valve and he was destroying himself. We'd seen him multiple times before. We had given him resources for care. And in spite of that, here he came another time, drunk, uh, drunk obnoxious, very sick. And in the room next to this lady where we just had a spiritual moment where she had done everything the doctor said to no avail. And she was losing her battle. This other guy here had ignored everything that we had told him and continued to destroy himself. And it occurred to me, and this is the story and I'll shut up with this, is that this late, we, we stand in between these stories and you will as a medical professional. And this lady would have given so much to have this guy's body. She would have nursed it back to health and considered it a blessing on this guy who was destroying it himself. And yet we cannot judge. We can only provide the resources. And I suppose it, I'm nowhere near burnout after 44 years, but I, I swear that the cases that continue to occur where I don't feel like I can help people very much who take an active role in their own demise concerns me. Um, let's take another one or two questions and then we'll call it a night. What do you do if you see another doctor doing something wrong? You want to take one? Uh, Melanie? Uh, sure. So, I mean, I think that we have certain obligations. Like, I mean, obviously your, your primary obligation is to the patient over your colleagues because we're really all there for the patient. So I think, I think what I would do if I saw somebody that was, you know, I mean, also I think like, for example, to again, take the emergency department, because I think a lot of us are ER docs, like the, the one thing that I really like about the emergency department, it's a very much of a team sport. And sometimes the doctor taking care of the patient is missing something. Um, I, I think that most people that really care about the patient are amenable to like feedback and 
uh, insight and, you know, like they want, to, you know, like I'm not, I think that, you know, we all have to like have a little humility, right? And like, if you don't know what's wrong with the patient, it's okay to ask for help. If you need help with a really sick patient, I think there's a lot of people that are happy to come in, want to help you. And it is a, it's a team effort and we all can help each other and learn from each other. But ultimately, if your colleagues say like, is coming to work drunk or doing something that's like an acute danger to patients, then I think your ultimate uh, responsibility is to the patient and not your colleague. And I think we can all kind of like try to work together in, in that aim, if that answers the question. Yeah, I think that's great. Uh, there's sort of two types of wrong, uh, Reagan. There's where something that, for example, a, a physician or another healthcare provider coming to work under the influence of some sort of substance. That's clearly wrong. It's not acceptable, neither to the medical board or socially or to the, to the hospital staff or to the fellow colleagues. But then there's the situation where I might have an, a different opinion about how a patient should be managed compared to another doc. What I do and what I would recommend is a way to approach that is to approach the doc personally or the other healthcare provider and talk to them one-on-one -on -one and just say, this is what I think this is what I would do in this situation. And this is why, and I'm not getting into your business. I just wanted to make sure that I shared that with you. Something like that, Ray. And I wanted to say, I actually think that these discussions where it's not even a differing of, of opinion always, but sort of like a, you know, a discussion about what's best for the patient. They happen very, very frequently in medicine. I mean, sometimes there are differing opinions um, but I feel like usually everyone, you know, we, we've all been sort of trained and the training I received is, um, usually everyone can bring concerns to the table and we can try and make sure all those concerns are like addressed in some capacity so that, you know, we're not doing something that makes a member of the team feel uncomfortable or where they think we're missing something. And like, I mean, this, this happens over and over and over again. And, healthcare where we're having team-based discussions about patient care. Like I was working last night even, and I went to go discharge a patient and one of our um, senior nurses came up to me and she's like, you know, I don't think this patient should go home. And I was like, okay, what's up? Like, what are your concerns? And she was like, I just really like, I can't put my finger on it, but I just really don't think that they're going to like thrive. And I, I'm just nervous. Like, I don't think this is a great discharge. And I was like, okay, like that, that's valid feedback. And so um, they didn't have anything like specific, they could say like that the patient's oxygen saturations were low or, you know, that they had a medical condition that necessitated admission. They, they just had sort of like a feeling that things weren't going to go great. Um, and part of it was the patient was developmentally delayed at baseline and the case manager wasn't available. And so what I did was took that feedback um, into consideration and I put the patient in our ED OBS unit and I rolled our social worker into the um, care and we planned to keep the patient overnight and kind of see how they did and like um, how things went throughout the course of the night. And then in the morning we were going to get a hold of the patient's case manager and like, you know, see what resources the patient had at home and the social worker started setting up home health nursing to go in and check in on the patient every other day. Um, so he had resources at home. And so I think like hopefully in healthcare, especially like the, the team-based model is really taking over and we've all learned to have these discussions and like pull in input. And I mean, honestly, if I have a seasoned nurse come to me and be like, uh, my spidey sense is a little off on that one. Like, I'd never ignore the spidey sense um, because I, you know, it, it keeps you out of trouble. And like, I, you know, I think it's a pretty valuable part of sort of the clinical picture. So Elaine, that's, that's a wonderful discussion. And I think that's a good place to begin to wrap it up for the evening. Somebody asked me uh, the other day, and I think I was doing an interview, I think of a, of a, of a, of a resident. And I think he was interviewing me back. And he said, if there was anything about Parkland Hospital that you would be able to fix anything or things, what would that be? Parkland being the busiest emergency department at large urban trauma center in the middle of downtown Dallas. 
And I said, I'll tell you exactly what it would be. It would be two things <clears throat> that if I'm discharging a patient from the emergency department and they, they need aftercare of any sort that I can hand a clinic appointment that has date and time and location to that patient. And all they do is have to show up. Um, because in our world of such complicated healthcare financing, whether it's Medicaid or the Parkland Financial Assistance Program, or what we see so much of, ladies and gentlemen, which is self-pay patients who have nowhere to go. Our problem with finding aftercare for these folks is exceptionally challenging. Um, a corollary to that is what Elaine just said. Elaine, that was a beautiful discussion, which is the fact the spidey sense, which means you we have to take in this era and the era to come when you are entering medicine, a team approach to management. This is not going away. Uh, we start the team approach with EMS. We have a social worker for our EMS system in the uh, uh, UT Southwestern Biotel system so that we take care of people at home. And so looking at a patient in the ER, like your nurse did, the spidey stance and said, I think this person's a little bit too frail. You say, frail, I'm busy. I've got 100 patients. I got to think about frail. Yes, you do. That's part of the job. The job is not complete. And then the other piece, the second piece that I would have said is that I would also be able to hand them their prescriptions, all of them paid for, because the, the, cost, of, the cost of medications is so odd. You know, where insulin 30 to 40 years ago cost 20 to 30 bucks a vial, and now it's 300 or more dollars a vial. We can do better than that in this country. And I certainly hope that our leadership moving forward with whatever the finances of our country are gonna look like will help us resolve these problems. Thank you, Dr. Salazar. Thank you, Dr. Morchetti. Thank you, Dr. Reno. Uh, Dr. Lipman, thank you for joining us. Uh, my thanks to the whole virtual shadowing team. Uh, we'll be here next week and we'll keep, we'll keep being here as long as you keep coming back. All right, thank you everyone and have a great evening. Good night.